All right, well, let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody to the very first ever Odyssey wow. Australia mm -hmm. webinar. I'm very, very excited and very proud to have this um, happening uh, right now and extremely delighted um, that we um, have our guest speaker um, presenting to us today, um, so Dr. Nigel Hughes. So thank you very much for um, providing this presentation uh, to us. And I think it's gonna really, um, you know, enthuse people to see where we could go uh, here in Australia and, and really learn from what you've been doing um, really well in, in Europe. So um, I just wanted to, quickly um, set the scene for everybody um, who might not know a lot about um, Odyssey. Um, and if you want to know more, we have set up a few communication channels uh, for Odyssey Australia. So we've just created a Odyssey Australia chapter uh, just this year. I'm very excited. We have our first website. Um, so www.odyssey-australia.org.au. And we also have our Twitter handle at AUS Odyssey, so at Oz Odyssey. So um, please keep, you know, in contact with us via those channels. Um, and I guess I really wanted to um, tell you where we've come from and, ha and how we actually got to where we are today. Um, so really the collaboration and the, the birth of Odyssey Australia has come from um, so a collaboration that's uh, been going on only a very short while now um, with the ARA Australian Health Research Alliance um, and what the Australian Health Research Alliance really wants to do is um, to fa facilitate the integration of healthcare and health and medical research um, and health professional education to deliver better outcomes for Australians and of course the goal um, of this is really pertinent uh, at this time and it's really to accelerate the pace and the scale of research translation into health and healthcare um, and really connecting all those phases of the research journey so that we can implement things as soon as possible. And I think you can tell in, in this day and age, this is an absolute critical goal. Um, so the ARA collaboration centres, as you know, um, translation centres in each of the states, um, have got a couple of different um, collaborations happening that has, has led to this uh, Odyssey Australia. So the first is the Health Analytics Research Collaboration, which is part of the SA or the South Australian Health Translation Centre, um, and the Transformational Data Collaboration, which is um, being led out of the MAC Australia um, group. So those two have really been, you know, the, um, the launch pad for Odyssey Australia. Um, so what the Transformational Data Collaboration is, uh, is the collaboration that really um, is being driven under this data-driven healthcare activity stream. And what we want to do is provide a forum, um, you know, or an open availability of common medical terminologies and data mappings for Australia. Um, and we want to leverage those mappings to provide um, resources for researchers to uplift their data into the common data model. And we also really want to establish a community of practice. And this is where Odyssey Australia really comes in. Um, so this is just, you can get this on the website, but really what we're trying to do is deliver three streams to Australia to help uplift data sets to um, generate evidence about healthcare. Um, we want quality data. We want to have a platform where researchers can um, use mappings in Australia and then also um, really help do the common data model translation. So I'm going to flick through um, some of this right now and just say, whoops, there's a lot of information here, I'll just flick through. Um, really what I wanted to do now is introduce Nigel Hughes, who's the Scientific Director um, of Observational Health Data Analytics and Epidemiology um, in Janssen Research and Development. Um, and hopefully he can show you how Eden has come together um, in the past, past being about a month ago, and now in the future um, in the era of this pandemic. Um, and just a plug for Nigel's um, podcast, if you haven't listen to it it's an absolute must listen to so um, have, have a look at that after this presentation you'll be very impressed so I'm going to hand over now to uh, Nigel and he can take it away 
So let me... Very kind of you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, not exactly sure how I do this. How do I do it? Uh, Can you just... So you stop, stop sharing, Nicole. And... I've got it. Yep. Okay, great. And I'll try. While I'm controlling this, thank you so much for the, that lovely introduction and that plug for the podcast. Uh, uh, we have to we have to be public about this. Nicole gets no commission for this. But, I do uh, not. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but that's very kind of you. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Right. Yes, you can see it now, slide. Nigel. Brilliant. Excellent. Very good. So yes. Yeah, so um, so I work for for Janssen. Uh, I work in, uh, in in the epidemiology group in the observational health data analytics. Um, some of you are familiar with Odyssey may have heard of Patrick Ryan, uh, who's uh, pretty much instrumental in, in Odyssey, and he's my boss. So that, that probably gives you a certain connection. Um, and I have a long history, a, a career in healthcare. So I worked in the National Health Service clinically for about sixteen years. I've been in various different. NGOs, uh, patient groups and so forth uh, over the time as well, um, all mainly around uh, viral hepatitis and liver disease and bloodborne viruses, HIV and so forth in my kind of formative career. Um, and then a number of different companies, uh, Roche, uh, Gilead Sciences, Novartis, and now for the last uh, almost 12 years now, uh, Janssen, uh, part, of, part of Johnson & Johnson. And uh, my role is um, is working basically in external collaborations, partnerships, and, and programs around uh, around real world data, and particularly public private partnerships. And uh, most of my time, officially half, but more than that, really, is taking up with Eden. And what I propose to do uh, this evening, your time, is is give you some background to where we are uh, with uh, developing so called federated networks in U in a European setting, uh, maybe a bit wider. Uh, talk about how we got to, to Eden, talk a lot about Eden, and then talk about some of the aspects that are related to clearly topically to, to now and obviously in terms of COVID-19 and so forth as well. I may skip some slides just because of time, but uh, as well as recording, I've said to uh, Nicole and Roger, I'm more than happy for these slides to be disseminated to, to everyone as well afterwards uh, too. So let's kick off. Um, it says... Let's see if this works. Yeah. Um, so I think to this audience, I probably don't need to uh, to go through some of these formative slides um, in, in that much detail. We all know working with real world data is a challenge. Um, just its very nature as a kind of byproduct, particularly of clinical care. Um, it's not captured, of course, um, for, for sole purposes of, of research. It's really conducted for, um, for, for, for clinical care and management. And actually, being topical about the pandemic, it will be probably likely to see that the quality and quantity of such data certainly in those who are managing COVID-19 patients probably degrades because you don't really have the time to to fill out electronic health records to the extreme because it might be being used for research of course you're trying to obviously manage and care for someone's life uh, and, and obviously this is a real challenge but not only that um, working with real world data could be uh, technically challenging but it's a socio-technical construct and there's a lot of social aspects to this, administrative aspects uh, that will create problems. Many of you may be familiar with this, of course, as well. Even contracting, if you're working with uh, commercial entities or academic entities, a mixture of both, uh, particularly on multi-site studies, which are becoming uh, the norm, I think, internationally. Um, these can take a month of Sundays. It can be really a challenge just to administer projects. And so, so really, a lot of our research it can take not weeks, not months, even sometimes years to conduct. Whereas, of course, what we really want are answers today, not in, in several tomorrows. Um, many of you may have seen this. It's a, used by many speakers, but from, from JAMA in 2014, where they looked at all types of data uh, that were being generated now, not long longer just in, in clinical setting, of course, but uh, by, by us as individuals, of course, and we all hemorrhage data constantly now from, from our technology, you know, smartphones and wearables and so forth as well, but also all the data that's kept on us, of course, whether that's uh, financial, for instance, uh, census records, uh, our own personal health records or whatever, uh, ph pharmacy records, all sorts of things as well, employment and, and so on. And actually, what people are talking about now, of course, is, is can we create this kind of like digital twin or avatar, avatar of ourselves um, but, but of course, the resolution of that probably is a merest shadow because of this is very disparate and diverse data held in many different silos. Um, and it's going to take some time before that 
digital twin has the kind of resolution, I suppose, overall phenotypically, that will be uh, extremely helpful going forward for research. And clearly this kind of cruciform, this cross in the middle here, um, where we're seeing a lot of clinical data, which we're all familiar with, um, and uh, in various vocabularies and ontologies and so forth, um, is what we're trying to concentrate on. But of course, uh, you know, this is actually a minority of the time people spend being unwell or living with chronic disease. You know, the, the 10, 15 minutes they may see a, a specialist or, or a primary care practitioner or whatever, it's really just you know a fraction of the of many years or decades, of course, that they're spending with their with their ill health, unfortunately, or comorbidities. And of course, it's all of this data outside of those 10, 15 minutes or whatever it is in different healthcare systems, uh, which is obviously going to be even more intriguing. And of course, a lot of time we're talking about structured data, maybe some semi-structured data, but clearly there's a wealth of information in unstructured data, which requires obviously an added tools like natural language processing and various other things to get to a point where we can generate uh, or utilize that data curate it and, uh, and generate insights so this is uh, obviously a clear challenge for us all we're all aware of that even more acute in this time of pandemic of course as well um, some of you may have been familiar with some of the outputs from odyssey so you'll see some of these slides but really we're going from kind of patient level data whichever source system or schema it's held in you know, both human and machine languages uh, and it's a long path and uh, complicated path to kind of create reliable evidence. Um, you may be familiar with this slide which is uh, you know the steam iron and of course uh, we're all familiar with the fact that wherever we buy our steam iron wherever we go internationally we're going to have to use adapters of course to, to be able to, uh, to, to plug it in. Um, so we're looking for things like data interoperability of course off the back of that, standardised analytic uh, tools uh, and, and platforms. It's not just obviously about curating the data, but also having a fairly standardised approach to, to analyse it and generating insights. Likely increasingly within data networks. And so Nicole, your earlier points about creating, you know, already have created Australian networks and are building upon that in terms of Odyssey. But of course, one of the things we also want to see is, is, is interconnectivity internationally, you know, across regions and eventually globally as well. Of course, and this will be quite transformational, and it's already starting to be uh, uh, now, but certainly in the future. And and also because it's socio-technical, it's about having a strong community, of course, as well. That helps in terms of sustainability, you know, common goals, particularly in terms of research use cases, but overall in terms of driving a lot of these these developments. So um, what Odyssey has done uh, over the last uh, several years now, uh, stemming from OMOP, the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, which created the common data model as we discuss it now, and then Odyssey, which has become a fairly self-sustaining global international framework and community, has introduced this common data model to kind of circumvent some of the curation and other technical aspects and challenges that we face when dealing with real-world observational data. Um, and, and certainly uh, with, with Odyssey, uh, this project uh, Eden and also before EMIF, and I'll talk a bit more about those momentarily, have, have really capitalised and are utilising the Odyssey framework, if you like, within, uh, within certainly the European setting, but clearly also what you're trying to do, uh, planning to do in Australia and, and elsewhere internationally as well, Southeast Asia, North America and so on. And again, all that linkage between all these different regions. Um, of course, some of the some of the key challenges is developing this 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 infrastructure, and I always try to use an analog an analog that it's like a kind of akin to a digital railway network. You know, can we lay down those digital tracks in between? In this case, not necessarily stations, but but sites that have relevant data: you know, hospitals, hospital networks, primary care networks, claims databases, regional uh, registries or cohorts, and so on, where we can then have study trains running between them all. From different researchers and so forth but again it's more systematic and having railway no network. I did make a mistake in this slide you may have spotted it um, and this is because this photograph is of a, a the railway network in the southeast of England so southeast of, uh, of London and, and, and so forth south of England uh, which is not known for being reliable uh, cost effective uh, or that efficient particularly um, and, uh, and, and you know, the principle I think is, is, is the right one but certainly maybe not the example at least in this in terms of this uh, this particular railway network um, and also and I stole this 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 comment 
from uh, actually a participant at a conference in 2019, and I don't know who it's attributable to, but they're actually talking about the National Health Service in England, but I think this is probably common in many healthcare systems that we have more pilots than an airline. Uh, it's probably um, a rather somber uh, comment uh, right now these days in terms of what's happening globally with the pandemic, but there's certainly lots of projects, lots of initiatives and so forth, and really what we need to do is, is we probably have some fairly big bang approaches, if you like, to, to, to really uh, accelerate things, particularly on a, an international level. Um, many of you probably are familiar with this paper by George Ripshack and others from Columbia um, and the Odyssey Network in the Proceedings of the National Academy from 2016, where they looked at uh, 11 data sources uh, in four countries. So over 250 million patients, all on a common data model. And then all of these data sets that you see, claims databases, you're probably all familiar with CPRD, for instance, in England, uh, the Japanese database and so on, looking at type 2 diabetes, hypertension, depression. And they just want to look at in these sunburst plots, first, second, third line therapy and so on. And um, a fantastic example, I think, particularly if you look at you know, this one, for instance, the claims database, um, you know, everyone pretty much gets metformin, the cheap generic. And then after that, I think the technical term for this is it's a dog's dinner. Um, but no one is really following, as you can see internationally, very similar guidelines, if at all, uh, whether national or international in the treatments of these different diseases. It clearly shows wherever you live, uh, your treatment is different. And consequently, and of course, the next question after this, of course, is, and what are those outcomes? And, and that's a really key aspect, I think, of all of this, is ultimately feeding back in terms of what are these outcomes internationally and so forth? And you know, are we therefore ensuring that where we see better outcomes, um, that we can see that uh, spreading more widely than, than interventions or treatments with poorer outcomes? Of course, bearing in mind local and other differences, of course, uh, whether in the healthcare system or, or individual patient. Uh, but certainly, you know, I think very revealing. And I think also what's very revealing is that this study took actually less time to do the analysis than the write-up and to get it published. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, I think, boded well from, from, from 2016 onwards in terms of what was feasible in, in, in accelerating research using standardised analytics on top of a common data model internationally. And more recently, this was last year, late last year, October, from the Lancet and Suchard and, other, and others, was looking at the, you may have seen the LEGEND study, the LEGEND HTN study in hypertension, which again was looking at nine data sources in this case. Six were claims, three were EHR. Again, four countries, interestingly enough, 4.9 million patient records. And they, the authors suggest, suggest that this was equivalent to, to actually in running in parallel 22,000 observational studies, one of the largest studies probably of its kind. It's a fascinating study where they really looked at first line monotherapy for uh, initial diagnosis of, uh, of, of, of hypertension, high blood pressure, of course, uh, and actually whether or not uh, the, the classes, the drug classes, uh, matched what the guidelines had said in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, outcomes again for, for cardiovascular events and so on. And again, reiterating that how quickly you could do these types of studies and off the back of the previous slide, you know, what are the treatment options and so forth, but then moving forward, what are the outcomes and so forth, and what does that say in terms of clinical treatment based on guidelines and evidence-based medicine, not tomorrow, but today. And I think this is a really key issue in terms of, if nothing else uh, about, about my presentation today, is that, that it's, it's temporal, it's about time. Uh, we're all used to most of our in, insights being generated post hoc, inclusive of things like during a pan epidemic or pandemic. You know, much of the data is not available till later, and we generate insights later when actually they're useful and they're great maybe for the future, but they don't tell us much about how to manage things today. And this is really a singular challenge globally. Just changing tack, uh, IMI, Innovative Medicines Initiative, I just want to mention this, and you may or may not be uh, familiar with this, it's unique actually globally. There isn't an equivalent, I think, anywhere else in the world. It's a public-private partnership, IMI, uh, between European Union and industry. It was set up uh, almost 12 years ago. There are almost 150 projects to date with actually over 5 billion, uh, it's 5.5 billion I think now in, in funding, a half of which is from the European Union, taxpayers' money uh, in cash, and that pays uh, for all the public partners' uh, time and efforts in each project. Um, and then half from industry, the FBA is the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, but the representative body for the pharmaceutical industry, and who, who have supported in kind 
or in cash, the other 50% in all projects. So all projects are a mixture of public and private partners. We'll see that when I go into more depth about Eden and so forth later. Um, and uh, there will be IMI1, there was IMI2, which we're in now, and there won't be an IMI3, it's going to be called something different. At the moment it's been called um, uh, Public-Private Partnerships Innovative Healthcare. I think they're going to have to come up with a sexier title than that. Um, but that's probably going to be even larger in terms of scale and funding and also would include things like medical device agency uh, associations and others as well representing the medical device industry so not just pharma uh, because of course everyone is looking for real world data to generate real world evidence um, so this was about accelerating r d speeding up patient access to innovative treatments citizens uh, accessing this in europe and ultimately improving outcomes and safety of medicine all around collaboration and it's a really unique experience to collaborate not just with public partners but also many other pharmaceutical companies all in the same project in a pretty competitive environment and all the projects most of the, all the projects i'm going to talk about now are funded under imi and that gives us a a particular i suppose advantage in the european setting so some of these i'll just briefly mention uh, ehr for cr electronic health records for clinical research which ran in imi1 actually from 2011 to 2016 uh, was a really formative project looking at how can you optimize clinical trials using uh, clinical federated networks. In other words, having a number of different hospitals, that was 11 in four countries if I recall, all using a, a common data model at that, kind, that time, not, uh, not Omar, but predated Omar. Um, but, but enabling you to, to run your study protocol and evaluate your inclusion exclusion criteria, potentially do strategic site and participant selection, and ultimately work on things like um, EHR to see to um, to, um, to clinical trial systems without all the kind of intermediate um, technologies and layers. Um, but uh, EHR for CR ran, I say, for, for five and a half years, actually. It scaled up to something called the Insight Program with a roughly more than 25 million health records in about 30 different hospital settings across Europe to support clinical trial optimization and then was acquired by an international organization called uh, Trinetics uh, uh, earlier last year. And so they, they have uh, sites in, uh, in, in Asia, uh, many in North America, uh, a few in Europe, but then added many more because of the acquisition of the Insight program, uh, which was formerly EHR for CR, and that's now a commercial entity. Even if I'm going to talk a bit more uh, momentarily, the European Medical Information Framework, kind of parallel to EHR for CR 2013 to 2018, um, and that was a very large scale project, 57 partners in 14 countries, 56 million euros in funding to create a technology and governance framework, such a technical construct, again, for using real world data from diverse settings to be able to assess um, and uh, interact with and then use for, for real world evidence generation. And actually predated, uh, everyone was kicking themselves when the publication came out. The concept of FAIR, but findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data, which everyone talks about now, uh, was kind of uh, immersed a bit in terms of what EMIF was trying to do. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later, as I will do EDEN, the European Health Data and Evidence Network, which started in November 2018 and actually will go on to, not 2023, it's a typo, sorry, but 2024. That's a five and a half year project again as well. I'll talk more about that in, that in a moment. And there's some future projects called EU Pearl, for instance, looking at things like um, um, platform trials and protocols for those, as it were. H2O, which should start some point this year, all being well, uh, looking at patient-generated data, like ePros and so forth, in Sentinel sites, uh, in, uh, in, um, in initial use cases um, within the project uh, to, to increase the opportunity for, the, for, for generating such data. But it would be a challenge, of course, in terms of linking that to clinical data, so we get more phenotypic background. And then a program called Big Data for Better Outcomes, um, Harmony, which is still ongoing in hematology, oncology Roadmap, which is completed now its initial phase in Alzheimer's, uh, Big Data for Heart, Cardiovascular, Pioneer and Prostate Cancer. Uh, all of these are creating federated networks across uh, Europe uh, in these different disease areas, as well, except, road, uh, except Harmony, sorry, in hematology oncology that's using a centralized model, but also still using the common data model. And in Eden, which is actually agnostic to any disease area, but also creating a federated data network. Um, just briefly mention a very complicated slide, apologies, but um, in EMIF, which is say completed as a project in uh, 2018, um, discovering, assessing, accessing, and reuse or use of data, created a number of tools, a catalog, 
so uh, metadata driven where is all this data can i can i find out about them can you describe that data can you describe the data institute for instance or the data partner or custodian uh, everything from who they are to when do they meet for for, for governance or approval process uh, and and tell me a bit more about their data as well kind of kind of, kind of can i kind of uh, uh, test drive it a bit if you like for uh, before using it which often we, we you know, aren't in a position to do of course and that's very challenging um, we did this in, in, in large-scale EHR related data and using increasingly over time in the project the OMOP common data model and the obviously tool framework and various tools and remote research environments it's a bit more of a centralized model that moves to more of a federated model over the scan of the project and actually there were sub projects as well not only the technology and governance framework EMIF platform but also EMIF AD Alzheimer's and even metabolic in the technology and governance framework. Oh, sorry, in the, uh, in the in in development of early biomarkers uh, for um, for these two disease areas in terms of metabolic consequences, obesity or Alzheimer's. Uh, and in Alzheimer's, we created a kind of mirror, if you like, of a cohort tool, a catalogue, and various tools, a cohort explorer, to enable researchers to create, if you like, a nested cohort within the overall mapped um, uh, registry data from across Europe from different sites. Uh, and then into at, the, at that time using Transmart as a private remote research environment then to conduct the research and we used something we call Switchbox which actually was a, um, a particularly nuanced version of the OMOTCOM data model to use Alzheimer's, a, a, a specific Alzheimer's data set from all these different registries. Um, so EMIF kind of also fed into the creation of, uh, of EDEN the European Health Data and Evidence Network, and we want to create a observational research ecosystem and enable better health decisions, outcomes, and care. Um, which sounds great, but how are we going to do that? So our mission is to create a, a large-scale federated network of data sources standardized to a common data model using research use cases to generate evidence now or soon, uh, rather than many tomorrows again, to see if we can, uh, can do this more effectively. So rather than just uh, laying the, the railway tracks, can we actually again run those study trains efficiently on those railway tracks uh, and actually you know, improve the journey as it were and the eventual outcome for the passengers, in this case patients. Um, and, the, and therefore the emphasis is, is really on evidence generation rather than necessarily you know, the, the socio-technical aspects which have led to our ability to conduct research at scale using all of this different framework. Um, there's 22 partners, as I mentioned already, 2018 to 2024, 66 months. Uh, budget is almost 29 million euros, so 50% from the European Union taxpayers' money. That pays for all the public partners, industry, and it shouldn't. It uh, doesn't get a cent, but it provides actually 50% in cash and in kind. Uh, Erasmus Medical Centre with Prof Associate Professor Peter Heinbeck in Health Data Sciences is uh, the, the coordinator of the project, my counterpart as it were. We have uh, University of Oxford, uh, University of Aero in Portugal, Tartu in Estonia, the Uppsala Monitoring Centre in uh, Sweden from the WHO, National Institute for, for Health and Clear Excellence, but NICE from, from England. Uh, we have a number of SMEs, small to medium enterprises, small tech firms if you like, the Hive and Odysseus who are very involved in, in the Odyssey community. Um, in vocabulary development, technical aspects, and so forth as well. Synapse is our product management partner. I've done many, many IMI projects as well. Um, the European Patients Forum, which I think in terms of transparency and patient engagement is uh, critical these days and very important. And also ICHOM, if you're familiar with them, but the International Consortium for Health Outcome Measurement, who develop health outcome measures in different disease areas, which they've launched internationally. And we want to incorporate some of these measures where applicable into the common data model to accelerate their update with their utilization in terms of, uh, again, evaluating health outcomes. And then Janssen, who I work for, of course, and therefore I'm the project leader uh, of, of all of these companies, all of which I'm sure you're familiar with, but 11 of us. So there's 11 public partners and 11 uh, equally matched um, um, pharma companies. Um, as well, all working, as I say, in collaboration across the project and different work packages and pillars and so forth. Um, I'm going to skip this, just quickly talk about uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, well, we want to harmonise data, standardise to the common data model. It says here more than 100 million, just take that as, um, uh, as a lot, really, but it should be well in excess of that, actually, across Europe from different diverse uh, data partners, data sources, in a federated network. I'll talk a bit more about that momentarily again. Uh, but really where your know, data stays local and uh, the query, the question, if you like, is taken to where the data is. 
uh, in a community which we want to, to grow in terms of not just data partners and researchers, but you know, academia, industry, regulators, payers, governments, NGOs, and others. I didn't mention here in a previous slide, but one of our special partners, who's not a partner in the consortium, is the European Medicines Agency, who are working with very closely on kind of convergent use cases and, and their, their in, in increasing interest and potential adoption of the common data model and the Odyssey tools and framework and so on. Uh, which is a fantastic opportunity, of course, as well. Education, we're launching actually later this week publicly, but it's been used in the, in the project, the Eden Academy, which is based on the Moodle platform, but that's actually um, an online, going to be a free resource for anyone working with real-world data, particularly in the Odyssey framework. So it's going to be a partnership between Eden and Odyssey, and we're very symbiotic, unsurprisingly, um, but in creating this Eden Academy, which we'll say will launch uh, all being well this Thursday, uh, with uh, all sorts of content material and so forth and we'll create learning pathways for different users as it were those doing ETL and mapping which is currently the, the focus I'll to explain why in a moment uh, but also researchers and, and so on and data parks and so forth. Ultimately again I say can we generate outcome and outcome measures but outcome evidence in terms of uh, and actually running use cases on top of all this work uh, going through the project and then beyond it as well and there's obviously a big focus on generating something sustainable. You know, if the project ends and that's it, that will be a pretty disastrous in April 2024. Um, I'm going to skip some of these. I think just in terms of uh, in terms of building projects, and I suppose in your own minds in Australia, it's my own construct here, but you know it starts clearly with a question or questions, queries and so forth. We're building something akin to an engine, if you like, in this case a network, we're fueling that. Uh, hopefully with data and then you want to apply or drive this around of course in terms of this fuel built engine this is very much supported clearly by technology but that's not the only aspects and maybe not even the, the whole of the challenge now because actually if we can't engage particularly with those who have data and that's the, the challenge is that for a lot of people working in this field isn't your data it's somebody else's data particularly for industry point of view it's those uh, you know who are generating data for instance clinically or in a claims database or whatever they, they would need to be involved some way in fueling this engine, this federated network. And there needs to be some kind of quid pro quo. Otherwise, why would you do it? I mean, you could buy data, but it doesn't always result in good outcomes, just not based on financial you know, remuneration. Um, and also outreach. You know, okay, you generate, you drive and apply this, and generate evidence, but where is that landing in terms of clinicians, academics, regulators, payers, and so forth, and what confidence do they have in this whole process in terms of what outcomes you, you've generated? Uh, and this is a long debate that we've had with the European Medicines Agency, for instance, on the fidelity of mapping from uh, source data to the common data model, and do you lose anything, of course, in, in as a consequence, and does that impact on your research outcomes? And in fact, actually, EMA conducted a study, which they published only uh, a couple of months ago, um, looking at Acuvia data, commercial data, which they mapped to the common data model, and they re-ran a coding study in pediatrics. Um, actually, they you know, compared the source data study they did originally with the mapped data study they re-ran. With a few tweaks um, and a few uh, six or so recommendations, all very positive, they found actually very little impact on the ultimate uh, outcome, the results of the, the source versus the, 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 uh, the mapped uh, data uh, version of the study. So uh, I think you know it, it, these are really important because ultimately the, those receiving the evidence need to have confidence in it. Uh, I'm going to skip over work package structure and so on. Just quickly mention the federated network and so forth. Just to say again, every data partner, the data stays local. There's a mapped version of their source data, whether that's the HR or claims or whatever. There's a tool, a node that we, we are, which is called Arachne, which is from our Odysseus partner. It's actually an open source. They created this tool which allows us to run things like the querying and so forth and the intercommunications between the central platform and these different partners, as it were. And under things like general data protection regulation in Europe, and then, you know, similar to the California privacy uh, law now and so on, it is a kind of uh, privacy by design. So local governance and firewalls are in place. Uh, approvals still remain local in terms of you know, research approval, ethics, and so on as well. And uh, they have complete auditable oversight in terms of what's happening in terms of querying and so on. So no data is moved. Uh, it, patient level data is queried, but, but then uh, the only results are population level aggregated outcomes that's central to the platform based on obviously obviously tools and, and the framework and tools like Atlas and many others as well. 
Um, you've probably all seen this image, but this is a schematic of the common data model, which is very patient-centric, tabular, extendable, and so forth. And this is iterative, of course. This is, I think, version 5.5, which we're using, uh, no, 5.01, we're using 5.5 now, 5.6, uh, within, uh, within Eden, because uh, all the tools are still based on, on that version. Uh, but it clearly is, it, it is iterative. Uh, of course, mapping is not uh, one, you know, fire and forget. Uh, you'll need to ETL or map to the common data model once and then afterwards update, of course, either as the data updates so and structure and so forth, the schema changes, or indeed, obviously, as the common data model improves over time. And of course, there are still many aspects where particular domain areas, like, for instance, mental health, genomics, many other areas are slowly but need to be added to, to this common data model over time so we can improve upon our ability to map such, such data and obviously generate uh, evidence and insights from it. But also based on common vocabularies and, and, and encoding systems, you know, SNOMED, LOINC and, and so forth as well. We've hit the ground in terms of running uh, various tools, um, so obviously working symbolically with Odyssey and really is representing, excuse me, Odyssey in Europe. We are taking on the EMIT catalogue that I mentioned earlier and extending that, but again very metadata driven. Also a number of tools, uh, to evaluate uh, data, either for the ETL mapping or subsequent to that, uh, including developing and supporting things like dashboard output, whether that's uh, generic dashboards or bespoke ones that will give us insights into some or many data, of course, in terms of different diverse data sources that were. Codes of practice, of course, are critically important. Again, it's socio-technical, it's not just the technical aspects, but particularly in this day and age with the concerns that people have around the use of data, and many even particularly topically right now, of course, and during the pandemic. Um, but again, you know, codes of practice are extremely important. And we're working on that with an ethics advisory board. We also have a scientific advisory board as well, as obviously we're working with us as partners in the project. And then various tools in terms of you know, supporting interoperability and then reuse and so forth of the data. Again, all again, preserving that, that local protection, if you like, and governance of, of patient record data. Um, uh, Two parallel aspects which are very critical in the Eden project are, are, are actually supporting uh, this diverse sort of math or expansive mapping of, of different types of data. We run two parallel calls. One is uh, for SMEs, so small to medium enterprises, uh, small tech firms, if you like, in Europe, who have an open call where we say, look, we will train and certify you as being able to map or ETL to the common data model based on a common Eden methodology is also contained within instance in the Eden Academy which has been used for last year to train our first batch of of, of, of trained now certified SMEs of which there are 11 so we had a call last year we just had another call in February and we've had uh, another probably 11 or 12 SMEs from about almost 30 applications that we've accepted across all of Europe again different countries particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, where we have a particular focus, a lot of gaps. Normally, a lot of our data in Europe is from the Nordics and the UK and Northwestern Europe, and we need to address that now in terms of opening this up to Central, Eastern, and Southern countries, of course, as well, where traditionally there have been many gaps, not just in terms of the SMEs, but importantly in terms of data. Uh, but these SMEs are not paid by us, but they are trained and certified for free. Meanwhile, data partners, again, hospitals, networks, uh, primary care claims, all those kind of things I've mentioned already and you're familiar with, um, can apply to us through open calls. Uh, we will say here, OK, we will provide up to 100,000 euros per legal entity. That's a procurement level in, in Europe, unfortunately, which we can't breach, um, which is unfortunate, a bit of a pain in the derriere, but never mind. Um, but it means that any legal entity can get, receive up to 100,000. I say legal entity because, for instance, if you had a network of five hospitals of all five legal entities, they could get five potential uh, subgrants. Um, but we will provide up to 100,000 euros. It's tiered according to the scale and complexity of the data, whether it's a full uh, de novo mapping, if it's an extension of fully mapped or partially mapped data, or indeed if it's just a certification of prior mapped data, we'll cater for all of those and working with our SMEs. But once they have gone through the application process through our portal, have been accepted, and we have a independent, partially independent data selection prioritization committee, and we also have a partially independent uh, SMEC or, or SME uh, certification committee as well. Um, but they select the SMEs and the data partners. Uh, data partners will go through to get the sub-grant agreement, 
um, from us, from our uh, harmonization fund of almost 17 million, and that's made up the core of the 29, almost 29 million euro budget that we have. But that 17 million is being spent only on these sub branches to all these different data partners. And then they can use that money to pay for an SME, which we kind of speed date through an SME directory on our website, even.eu, of all the certified SMEs that they could choose to work with in doing this mapping cycle on the right for ETL and mapping their, their data to the common data model. And then we will evaluate and certify that at the other end. And of course, then once mapped, we would hope, and also in installing an Arachne node and all those kind of things, that they would launch, they would join the federated network and work with us on you know, convergent use cases. Quid pro quo, of course, is that data partners could work independently amongst themselves. You know, a hospital network in Berlin could decide to work with a hospital network in Milan or Madrid or wherever and conduct research, evidence-based research outcomes, all those kind of things themselves, completely independently within this network. Again, this open railway network, if you like, and that's key, I think, again. Um, so we have a number of calls, I've mentioned those, uh, there have been uh, this, S this SME catalogue or directory, it's on our website, these are the first 11 SMEs from many parts of Europe and that's extending with a second call and there will be subsequent calls through the project till, till 2024, both for data partners and SMEs and the data partner calls will change over time in terms of being general calls, to so being more specific to different geographies and or different disease areas like oncology for instance or respiratory disease and I'll come to COVID-19 in a moment. Um, so obviously we also need to ensure it is a socio-technical construct that people, tr you know, believe and trust us, of course, you know, if everyone is in this quadrant here, trusted and relevant, maybe that's what they, you know, think of Eden, great, but they, they may not, maybe they, they think we're relevant, but they may be a bit wary of us, don't really know us, uh, they may think, they may trust us, but think we're not very relevant to them, or they may think we're not relevant and they don't trust us. So, so we actually have to do a lot of work and we have a whole, whole work package working on things like value propositions and sustainability and so forth to, to work with data partners who uh, we, we would like to move to this yellow quadrant, as it were, in, in supporting kind of openness, transparency and, and collaboration and so on. And it's particularly important and clear that it be very transparent on what we're doing also, but also uh, in terms of you know, intended use of data and that they retain control and oversight and all those kind of things I mentioned. And also that we adhere to things like the general data protection regulation, we have code of practice uh, being developed, you know, I think it's a bias report, it's a whole thing about privacy by design. GDPR, albeit you know, remarkable regulation, is very challenged in Europe at the moment because of maybe poor interpretation there and therefore an even poor implementation there and we've had serious challenges as a consequence, which really has impacted already on use of real world data, inclusive of during this time of the, the pandemic. I could talk and wax lyrical for hours just on this subject, but clearly we don't have the time, but, um, but you obviously hopefully get some insight. Uh, we've got various use cases, things around drug utilization studies, drug and device safety studies, HTA, or technology assessment, because we're clearly our involvement with, uh, with, with partners like NICE and then the EU network, the UNETA. A network of, of HTA bodies as well, but we will run a number of these use cases to show we can generate evidence that we haven't just built a network, isn't that great, but actually works and we can utilize the data and try the real world evidence and so forth. And also work with other partners and parties, like I mentioned, European Medicine Agencies and others. We also have a, a study a thon, uh, which has been, uh, is, so you may have heard about these, but we run studies from like Monday morning basically to Friday afternoon. And by the, by the end of the Friday afternoon, we've got either abstracts or the beginnings of manuscripts where we've conducted all those studies. And in this case, this was the first one we did in, in December 2018, looking at unicompartmental partial versus total knee replacement and actually uh, um, trying to emulate predict the outcomes of something called the Top Cat study, which was published a bit later in 2019, uh, which was a real world study, uh, sorry, a controlled study of, uh, of both of these interventions. And we, we do use observational data from five databases in the US and, uh, and the UK, and then later other, other databases internationally all mapped to the common data model to run characterization, prediction studies, population effect estimation studies, and so forth, all in five days rather intense um, but it does work we subsequently had one uh, looking at so the outcomes from rheumatoid arthritis and the different disease modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs uh, as well in january uh, in barcelona and then we subsequently have had in collaboration with odyssey driven by odyssey the covid19 study of thorn which is a remote 
uh, version uh, over, uh, over over the wire, as it were, in over 30 countries and over 30, 330 participants. And I'll uh, come to that in a minute. Um, I mentioned the academy already, but that will go live later this year, uh, later this week. Apologies, um, but it's um, uh, it's going to be a free resource, I say, to anyone working in this field and wanting to learn a lot more about real world data and using um, using uh, the, the Odyssey framework. Um, we also want to build something that's sustainable. Uh, you can probably look at this slide at your leisure when they're circulated, but it just goes into some of the key points that we need to develop over time. So we have something that doesn't finish in 2024, as I mentioned as an IMI project, but actually goes on for many years or even decades later, based around, again, the Odyssey framework. And of course, the linkage then between what we do in Europe to what happens in North America, Southeast Asia, uh, Asia Pacific, still Asia and so forth, um, in terms of that more global framework. And actually over a billion health records already mapped to the common data model internationally anyway. We really want to see that improve and increase. So uh, the study I thought I'd mentioned, uh, which was uh, four days, uh, very intense, looking at COVID-19, 37 uh, data partners, not so many with COVID-19 data at that time, but we looked at all sorts of things again around uh, characterization, uh, estimation and prediction. Uh, and this paper, which is uh, currently in preprint, but uh, been submitted, looking at, for instance, safety of hydroxychloroquine, very topical, alone in combination with this erythromycin in terms of uh, adverse event profile and so forth, in the known patients who already receiving it, which is rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, globally. You know, this is a well-defined adverse event profile in these patients. Uh, and so this is probably the largest study of its kind ever to characterise the safety of these drugs in these populations, as it were, which is clearly insightful for those now using this off-label, as it were, for treating, and we have to obviously see further studies in terms of uh, the evidence, in terms of using these drugs alone or in combination for, for treating COVID-19. And we have a new open call for those working uh, with COVID-19 patients who have clinical data to be mapped to the common data model. We can provide a grant up to 50,000 euros, again, scale to complexity and scope of the data and so forth. Uh, but we created a kind of rapid evaluation and turnaround and a task force to support this call, which is a bit different to what we normally do within our calls, um, so that we can start to accelerate, if you were, mapping of relevant data on COVID-19 to the common data model to conduct research, which again, hopefully gives us answers, well, at least today, if not, tomorrow but certainly not in several tomorrows where it may be sort of not as useful other than from an academic if not historical point of view um so really more uh, trying to do this now rather than again post hoc so this call went live last week last thursday we'll go for a month and we are uh, as we receive uh, applications we will review them apply sub grants and so forth accelerate the process and work with this task force which is a partners in the project but also SME, certified SME, and so on. We're giving up their time, in this case, pro bono, to support this effort, this, you know, this uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there's a whole load of things on, on COVID-19 and what's driving our questions. We really don't have time, unfortunately, to go through those. Just to mention, of course, I suppose, uh, unfortunately, but you can look at those, uh, you know, again, at your leisure. Uh, but Eden really is quite a bold step, I think. It's a kind of flagship project, not our words, but you know, the words of many others uh, in the European Union. IMI, European Commission, EMA, and many others, but we're really trying to conduct real-world research in the 21st century with 21st century tools. Um, and it's really about developing this community, this federated network, about an ecosystem based around a lot of quid pro quo, uh, around data use, you know, I see your data, you see my data, but everyone's still protected and so forth in federation. There's open science, open source community in, you know, linked into, obviously within Odyssey, and using the common data model, but all the standardized tools and there are a number of other initiatives going on in Europe things like what data saves lives which is trying to accelerate people's general public's understanding of why we need to use real world data not just in terms of the risks which most people concentrate on but actually what are the benefits of sharing our data particularly in this day and age to, to generate insights and to and create evidence and then there are a number of uh, contact points Peter and I various different websites some of you probably would be familiar as it were and also for Eden our website uh, email address, uh, we're on our Twitter or on LinkedIn, we have a GitHub and, and so on as well. Um, but um, are various ways to contact us as a project too. I'm going to stop there. I've left probably only about 10 minutes, unfortunately, for questions. My apologies. Um, but uh, I sincerely hope it was uh, an interesting talk and at least some of it was, was informative. But thank you so much again, particularly to Nicole and Roger for the 
time and opportunity to present today to you all in Australia. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Nigel. Um, that was really informative talk and really excited about the Eden Academy being um, rolled out. I think that's going to be an amazing resource um, for the researchers. So um, the easiest way to do question and answers is perhaps leave yourself on mute unless you have a question and unmute yourself and we'll see if we can um, work this out. So please go ahead if you've got questions. Silence is a good or bad sign. <laughs> it's Tang here. Hi. Uh, thanks uh, for the wonderful presentation, uh, Nigel. I just, uh, just, just I mean, I've done a bit of reading about Eden, but I'm um, just interested in that um, uh, call for clinical data. Yes. That you just mentioned. Um, what's involved and what's, what are you kind of looking for? Yeah, it's a good question. So the COVID-19 call, Actually, oh, you know, next, sorry, I can't too far forward. But the COVID-19 call, um, I mean, clearly uh, what we've seen, and also in Odyssey, one of the challenges, I think, is that a lot of MAP data sets internationally are mainly primary care and claims data. It's a bit less in terms of hospital, except, so for instance, in the study of THON, which we did at the end of March, our South Korean colleagues were remarkably quick at mapping hospital data particularly also from critical care setting where you know sadly a lot of patients have turned up of course been admitted to um to, to the omar commodana model and actually the south korean government after a whole load of uh, negotiations created a uh, open data initiative to allow that to be used uh, for international research but still we have a real challenge that I and mean, it's a conundrum isn't it because the paradox is that uh, we're generating clinical data, which is incredibly insightful potentially for, for, for dealing with COVID-19 now. You know, we have so many unanswered questions, clearly, uh, in, the, in the treatment and management of the disease alone, let alone anything else. Um, but those generating the data are really, probably, to be quite fair, rather busy in doing that, uh, you know, in, 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 in treating and managing the disease. And therefore, a lot of centres are not in a position to, to do anything right now, and that's quite understandable. But there may be centres, probably the larger centres, and the reference centres and so on, regional hubs and so on, uh, uh, academic clinical centres and so forth, who may have infrastructure to be able to still support uh, some work with their own data right now. So what we're saying is uh, we will we put together a task force of all our data, all the particular partners in the project in Eden, with our, some of our certified SMEs who will do this pro bono, and we'll work together in task force and we'll say, look, remotely, because of course all the lockdowns and restrictions, we can work with certain, uh, say, hospital or academic hospitals or whatever, who have uh, COVID-19 clinical data. So you know, they've got data from patients being treated in hospitals, uh, maybe primary care, and it's also important. Claims is going to be, you know, there's a long latency, so, so that's probably going to be likely to be helpful for some time. SNDS in France, for instance, as an example, has a two-year latency, so you won't get much benefit for, from that now for COVID-19. But for your treating data in hospital setting and your primary care setting, We'll map that for you to the common data model. We will provide you up to 50,000 euros to cover your time. So, you know, we still need people with domain and infrastructure expertise locally, who know their data, the context, everything else, to work with the task force. Um, so, that, so that money is to kind of compensate and cover for people's time uh, locally, as it were. But we will provide the rest of the resource in terms of the mapping. We hope to accelerate, obviously, and speed up that mapping cycle so that depending again on the data set and we're looking at really a very specific data set allied to clinical variables and similar to COVID-19 so this is a very focused uh, mapping exercise in future it may extend then you know that data partner may be able to go for future more funding and say right we'll extend to you know, your whole EHR your whole you know your whole hospital database um, but for now, we're really just focused on, on clinically relevant data to COVID-19 in this call and not anything else, as it were. And I briefly mentioned it, but this is a slide from Patrick Ryan uh, and tweaked by others, I think, in Odyssey. But just looking at the type of data you know, across the kind of longitudinal temporal timeline of someone being infected and then presenting and so on. And what type of data could be available and what type of questions it could answer and so on. And, you know, over a certain time window and so forth very much again in the clinical setting which will support again characterization population estimation question level prediction studies and so forth you know who gets sick and, and and how do they progress and so forth and 
uh, you know, what, what are the potential predictors for a certain progression, as it were, treatment outcomes, um, how do these compare in, in terms of, you know, you know, what are predictions probably for certain patients to progress versus others, and, and so on, and what does this compare to other diseases? You know, we use the surrogate in, in the study of them for flu, for instance, which clearly is not COVID-19, but, you know, people do develop a pneumonia, some people do end up in critical care setting and so on. So we, we can use some analogues, but really we, we really need the relevant data from, from, from the pandemic, from patients now. So, sorry, I've gone over a monologue, but hopefully answers your, your question. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, Nigel. Uh, it's, uh, it's Dougie Doyle here. Hi, um, some, of the, uh, some of the people that might be online may be... Um, less familiar I, th I think it's it's absolutely fantastic to see the the incredible things that we can actually do with odyssey um but it was interesting to see that some of the early routes were around you know, you, you were talking about transmart um, right right, right. yeah so i mean what, what's what's been the evolution here you know what, what is your rationale around why you think the odyssey was is you know this is where this has ended up yeah this sort of got there <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question, actually. No, Dougie, that's a great question. Yeah, I think, because um, I mean, yeah, we, when we were create, so uh, I haven't had a time to go through kind of you know, how IMI projects were created, but actually the calls, and you know, they're open calls for IMI projects, and Eden became a call, and that was created on the FP side, the industry side. And, and so we, among some of the partners, particularly us at Janssen and others, who proposed to Eden in collaboration with FP partners, and then, you know, a call, and then public partners, and so forth, really heavily proposed uh, the OMOP uh, accommodation model. I suppose because Janssen's heavily involved, you know, through our EPI, my, my EPI colleagues um, within within Odyssey. We have adopted OMOP CDM within our company. We've mapped a lot of our internal data sources and contract data, you know, claims databases and so forth to it. We gained experience with an ENIF, you know, and, and, and initially it was a very decentralized approach. Oh, sorry, a very centralized approach, my apologies with an EMIF and we were using tools like Jabara Reloaded and so forth, scripts and so on, um, to start looking at a slightly federated approach. But then we adopted the common data model. We mapped about 10 data partners in various uh, levels to that common data model in an EMIF. It was the first large scale approach to doing that in Europe at that time. So it's going back a few years now. Um, and actually, you know, that I think has set the foundation for this interest. Also a number of countries, Denmark's a good example, uh, but others as well have started their own work in using the OMOP common data model. So there's kind of an organic development, and we're kind of accelerating that, I suppose, through Eden. A number of pharma partners, uh, we created a survey of the 11 partners, but a number of them, probably about three or four, are quite advanced in their use of the OMOP CDM and the Odyssey framework, and many others are, from, shall we say, in the experimental stage. And increasingly, a number of academic partners, of course, are moving to this. So I think kind of de facto, a bit like CDIST uh, has become a standard for, you know, for, 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 for randomized clinical trial data you know, that was created and became you know, an accepted international standard. I, I, think, I think by default, OMOP is, is just by sheer weight of volume, if nothing else, is becoming a de facto standard in its own right. It is not the only common data model, you know, FDA Sentinels, a version of Cori, common data model version of that and so on. And probably, you know, best to avoid, we, we try, of course, to avoid a battle of the common data models because, you know, they're not perfect and they do have uh, their upsides, but certain downsides. But, you know, that's also in the nature of working with real world data. I think anyone striving to have the rigor of real world data versus, say, randomized clinical trial data is a, bit of a fool's errand, of course, just in the nature of how it's even generated. So knowing all of that, I think, again, our view is that the common data model, the Odyssey framework, fits particularly well uh, just think for many of our needs and in particular in terms of potential speed like running those study of thumbs yeah uh, yeah fantastic and in terms of the the academy is a very exciting development and uh, I hope so. <laughs> uh yes i mean obviously it's uh, it, it's there for uh, stakeholders you have in in the fantastic um eden space but is that something that we might be able to um, totally. get involved yeah. in there are, there are very there are, they're very difficult to have borders in the digital world, isn't there? So which is nice. So <laughs> so uh, so no, this this all, this is really uh, this effectively will become the Odyssey Academy, but it, it's it's generated out of Eden. We will move a lot of a copy a lot of Odyssey content, which there's a lot, into the academy while we develop learning paths with a, you know, creating a faculty and so on. 
And I think ultimately, give it a bit of time, we will develop a global resource with a global faculty and a global executive board and so on uh, to run this. And it may well just you know, become a spin-off in its own right, which would be fantastic. But uh, we have to kind of discardly say, because it's out of Eden, it's European funded and so forth. But actually, yeah, it, it, it is, once it launches, you, you, anyone can sign up and create their own account based on a platform called Moodle. Uh, very straightforward uh, and, and then and then you know take take hold of whatever course content you want to do and in the future different learning pathways so yeah uh, i mean once we launch we will we'll certainly keep you in the, in, in the frame as well it's hugely exciting sorry i better leave it open to someone else for that question but unfortunately i do have to um uh, to jump into another call my apologies i should have said this at the start but we've got a call related to our covid 19 call i really apologize but i do have to jump on no that's fine thank you just want to thank you so much nigel that was a wonderful presentation um and thank you. sorry as we know it's recorded so um please jump on the odyssey australia website um for right. the details and for any other details of um, more information you want about odyssey um, thank you very so thank much thank you again and thank you. thank you everyone for joining and we hope to do these presentations every three months or so so we will be in contact for the next one right one point i'll um I'll, you have the slides please circulate them and i will send you the details for the academy uh, once we've great launched. perfect great Fantastic. thanks so much everybody thank you so much yeah. everyone apologies we'll i have time. to jump so sorry, sorry. Thank you, no problem yeah. bye thanks thanks bye. thanks bye. thank you bye, bye.